Righty. Um, it's good to see everybody. Um, you know, this this kind of always piggybacks um, media days, and it just kind of lets you know football is really right around the corner. And so Coach of School is always great to be part of. Um, the impact that the high school coaches have, not only in football, uh, but, uh, but in every sport, um, the, the impact that they have on our young people um, to help prepare them for um, life is vitally important. So the fact that we get to be here to support that, um, offer encouragement and, and support to them is, I think, big. And so, um, but, but for me, it's always that kind of, kind of marker about a, about a week from now, we're, we're getting ready to go. And so um, I always kind of, kind of count back from media days to, to coach a school, and then um, we, we, got, uh, we start training camp. And so this is, this is that time of year. So um, looking forward to it. Uh, Mike Craven, Dave Campbell's Texas football. Um, you know, they talk about straight line recruiting here a lot with THSCA. I mean, you look at the trends, and so many more guys are leaving the state, not just this state, but all the states. Why do you think recruiting is so much more national than maybe it was when, when you were coming up? Um, I think there's a lot of layers to it. Um, you know, I think social media, uh, access to more players for more schools. You know, historically, back in the day, you had to go to the school to, to get to know the coach, to get to know the kid. You know, it was much more difficult when they had to just call the house, the home phone, to try to try to get the kid. Now, you know, the reach that schools have to get the young men, whether it's through text messages, direct messages on social media, different things, ability to see their film. Uh, film can, can get shared through Twitter or any other uh, format like that. So I think the reach is a little bit better for the schools. I think seven on seven. Um, has played a part in that. I think kids now are much more apt to go travel to play in different seven-on-seven -seven tournaments around the country. And so travel isn't so uh, foreign to young people. I mean, back in the day, maybe a kid would take a visit. It was his first time ever getting on an airplane. And now I think they're just more apt to, to go travel. Um, and, you know, I think conference realignment to some degree has something to do with that, that, that – Players are moving around, and I, and I think NIL has something to do with that. You know, at the end of the day, all those things adding up. I'm not saying one is more important than the other, but I think a lot of those things adding up to players are just more apt to to travel and to go to different schools. That doesn't mean that we're not trying to keep them here. We're, we're, we're trying like, like crazy, and our, myself and, and all the other schools in the state of Texas, and the majority of our team is from the state of Texas, but – you know, at the, our job is to field the best football team at the University of Texas. And so sometimes, you know, a player or two in state may decide to go out of state and, and we have an opportunity to recruit a really good player from another state. We have an obligation to the University of Texas to try to do that, to try to field the best team. Would I love to have every player from here and get every, the best players from the state of Texas? Of course, but that's just not the reality right now. Maybe it'll get back to that. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but, but, you know, that doesn't mean we don't try and we try really hard, but we also have a, a responsibility to field the best football team that we can. Steve Carter Yates with Dave Campbell's Texas football. I feel like you were one of the more vocal proponents of helmet communication, uh, for quarterbacks. Now that it's here, what are some of the impacts you could foresee on offenses in college football? Well, I, I think some of that varies to the style of offense, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now that the teams that go fast, that really want to go fast, that this is a distinct advantage for them because now you can talk directly to the quarterback. And I, I, I'm holding out um, on that opinion because the other 10 players still need to know what to do, right? And so, yes, I can talk to the quarterback, but how do I, how do I get the receivers and the linemen and everybody still knowing those plays? And so – it, would it minimize some of the signaling maybe on offense? But I don't know necessarily that they're going to be able to go faster because they still have to communicate to all those people. Um, I, I do think it is, um, you know, and, and for a team like us who's very multiple, uh, multiple personnel groupings, formations, motion shifts, sometimes we go fast, sometimes we huddle, sometimes we're somewhere in between. Um, it does allow us to be a little bit more efficient, um, to, to decide what tempo that we're going to operate in or what personnel grouping that we're going to. Um, why I like it, you know, having spent some time in the NFL and calling plays in the NFL, is that um, 
you can really communicate with a quarterback. And sometimes just voice inflection from the coach helps the quarterback understand the importance of something in a play. Um, it does allow you to give some subtle tips and reminders, and it may not always be for the quarterback. It may be for the running back or the right guard, whoever that is. Um, but I also think there's a real challenge defensively because just to think that one player on defense has a headset in, um, you still have to get, like I said, get that call to all 11 players on the field. And if a team's going with tempo, that's going to be difficult to do. So I just don't think we can solely rely on the helmet, to, you know, coach to player communication, that that's the end all be all. We still have to have our mechanisms in place to um, communicate with, with all 11 players that are on the field, whether that's signaling, whether that's the signals on field once the player gets that call. But um, that, that's, that's probably the challenge. And it's going to be a little bit of a work in progress because the college game is, is drastically different than the NFL. The NFL, everybody huddles, you know, and until two minute and guys start going no huddle. In college football, there's a lot more no huddle aspects to, to what teams do. And so the, the, the play caller is, especially defensively, is going to have to really be on point or is the team trying to go fast or not. And, and I think it's important that the play caller doesn't panic, that, that we show a lot of composure as a coaching staff to get our players the call in a timely fashion, but let's not be too quick to jump to a conclusion that they're necessarily going fast. And so there's layers to this thing that, that we, are, we work through in spring ball. Uh, but that we're going to have to continue to work through in training camp and, and really the first few weeks of the season. Uh, Kurt Bowles from the Houston Chronicle. Still uh, doesn't ring a bell to me. But, yeah. <laughs> Taking me a while, too. I'm waiting for the first time you make a mistake saying that. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> Why does there have to be one? So, no, I'm teasing. Uh, you're picked second behind Georgia in the preseason media poll. Mean anything to you? Flattering? Uh, you take confidence in that? You know, I, I I always do this exercise with the team, and I'll, I'll do it with them again, and I'll I'll show the preseason poll, and I'll show the um, preseason All SEC team, and I'll probably show four or five headlines of articles of of how great we're supposed to be, and then I'll probably show another seven or eight uh, articles or headlines or or quotes from Coach Saban saying we're not going to run the SEC, just as a reminder that people's opinions of us before we ever even play a game really don't matter. What we do is what matters. And so um, do I think we have a pretty good team? Sure, I do. You know, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't shy away from that at, at media days. But at the end of the day, it's not about what other people think. It's not about what we say we're going to do. It's about our actions. It's about the way we actually perform. And that's going to be our focus. Um, but so it just kind of is what it is. You know, I think it's great for college football. I'll say that. I, I, I love preseason polls. I love preseason all-conference teams and all-American teams because it gives the college football fan and the pundits stuff to talk about. And it keeps college football at the forefront of what's going on. And like I said, I think our sport is at an all-time high from a popularity standpoint. And part of that is some of this preseason stuff. Part of it is media days and things of that nature. So I, I do like that. Where we fall really is irrelevant. We have to go play the games and we have to perform and we have to um, work through the adversity that we get faced with and we got to rely on depth and we got to continue to develop our players as the season goes on. We got to keep working on our culture um, and we got to make sure that we have the right mental intensity, the right mental fortitude week in and week out to, to perform to the best of our ability. Yeah, I was going to ask you to follow up. Like 2009, Texas was in the national championship game and went five and seven the next year. So you just mentioned the mental side. Is that something you're going to have to stress even more than usual because you're coming off such a great year? Well, I think, um, you know, I think from where we were as a program over the last decade to where we got to last season, I think we still have a really hungry football team. And I think we got a taste of what it can, you know, being in a playoff taste like. Uh, but I also think the way it ended left a pretty bad taste in our mouth. And so I, I think we've got a very hungry football team that wants to get back. Um, and they've shown me nothing but um, the right type of work ethic, the right type of mindset throughout the entire offseason, throughout this summer, um, that I'm not – 
I'm not too concerned with complacency. You know, that we've got a hungry team. It's competitive. It's tough. It's tough-minded. Um, but again, as a coach, that's my job, right? Week in and week out to make sure that we have, um, like I said, the right mental intensity week in and week out. Because physically is going to be challenging. We all know that. Um, but the mental side is something that we can control. And I think that's something that we take a lot of pride in as a staff, uh, myself included, to try to put our players in the right frame of mind from a preparation standpoint. Because preparation is as much or more important than the actual action of playing the game on Saturday. Uh, Jeff Howhorns, 24-7. Sark, you lost some uh, special assistants from last year and had some uh, people in support roles move on. Just wonder whether it was you know, Scotty Hazleton or some of those special assistants or, or Chris Gilbert coming back or Bill Reese coming in. What, what were you looking for in those specific roles? What led you to, to hiring the guys you hired? And the ability now to have more, you know, more coaches actually coach in practice, how much did that impact who you wanted to add in those support roles? Yeah, I, I just try to be um... – you know, when, I, when I look at openings is can they make us better than we were, right? And, and, and where are our needs and, and what type of impact might somebody have in our program? Um, you know, I'll, I'll start with Chris Gilbert. You know, I hated it when he left. I understood why he left and, and, and going to North Texas, I understood all that. But I knew the type of impact that he had in our program. And – his relationship with the high school coaches, um, his relationship with the recruits and their families, his relationships with the current players on our roster. Um, he has a really good eye for me, even in practice. I'll bounce things off of him post-practice, post-game, just kind of the mindset where we're at as a team. So I do lean into to Coach Gilbert that way, and it's great having him back for sure. Um, Scotty Hazleton, you know, when you assess our, our season last year, you know, one area where I think we all could agree where we can improve is in pass defense. And like I said, pass defense has layers to it. Um, you know, if you want to be a really good pass defensive team, you got to have the ability to affect the quarterback, sack the quarterback, and put pressure on the quarterback, make him uncomfortable. If you want to be really good in pass defense, you have to have enough schematic, you know, variety but yet be good at those schemes and and we needed that as as a staff and then you have to have the players and the personnel that can guard people and make plays on the ball and in tight coverage and things of that nature i've always you know admired scotty from a distance i've known his history and his track record and his connection to gus bradley and and monty kiffin and the tampa two stuff and then you know his connection to to getting involved in kind of the system that i knew at alabama of, of a lot of the combo coverage stuff. And so to bring in a guy like that, um, that maybe can give us a little bit more variety coverage wise, that was big. And then bringing, bringing Bill Reese on board, I mean, just, just the expertise that he has, he's been doing it a long, long time. Um, you know, Coach Saban generally doesn't hire people that aren't good at what they do. And if they, if they aren't good at what they do, they, they generally don't last but one year. And the fact that he was with Coach Saban more than one year, and when I, you know, I lean into Coach Saban a lot, and when I got his recommendation on, on Bill, you know, we lost a couple people. Um, I really felt like we are, we are upgrading at that spot from an evaluation standpoint, not only the high school player evaluation, but potential portal evaluations, but then also evaluating our own roster and, and where are we? And he's done it at the highest level in the NFL. He's obviously done it at a really high level at the college game with Notre Dame and with Alabama. So I think all three of those guys are going to be impactful for our program. Three more. Oh, Hank Southhorns, 24 7. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, summer seems like there's been a lot of emphasis on the recruiting, you know, with everyone's fighting to get the official visits. Um, is it important to you to maybe try to wrap things up before the pr or prior to the season and then be able to you know, focus on things after the season when the portal opens back up? Or you know, are you trying to get that class, I guess, put together before fall camp as much as you can? And with decisions that do go different ways throughout the summer, is there more, you know, like how do you guys attack that once if kids are committed elsewhere? Or is there more finality to that, I guess, in this NIL era to where you maybe move on and you know, look elsewhere? Um. I've never been the one to panic in recruiting. Um, I think history kind of shows we usually close pretty good um, as we get into the season, as we get into December, as we get closer to that. I do believe a lot of times in the summer right now, a lot of recruiting is kind of the hype machine. 
um, but you actually have to put the product on the field and you have to play, you have to perform. Um, how, you, how do certain players in your program develop um, that they sold you on, you're just like him, but actually how does he play? And so we, we kind of believe in our process. Um, we're definitely a relationship-based operation, and, and we don't forego those relationships when a young man commits to another school. Um, and I'm sure just like kids that commit to us, they're not stopping talking to the guys that are, that are committed to us either. So um, at the end of the day, I think we've got a pretty good process to, to what we do. And, I, you know, I always say I just want to make sure the kids that commit to us are committing to us for the right reasons and that they're coming to the University of Texas for the right reasons. And I'm not saying that kids are committing to other schools for the wrong reasons, but sometimes those things bear themselves out. You know, Kelvin Banks wasn't committed to us at this time when, when he decided to come, and he's a preseason All-American. Anthony Hill wasn't committed to us at this time, and he's a pretty good player for us. And so over time, you know, we, we continue to build our relationships with the players in our program. Um, and some of them decide to come and some of them don't. But at the end of the day, when we assess all our recruiting classes, are we addressing the needs that, that on our roster? Um, are, we, are we building a team that we think can be better next year than it was this year? We're always trying to do those things. And do they fit us? You know, do they fit us from a character standpoint? Do they, do they fit us from a cultural standpoint? Um, and are they going to be somebody that comes on, onto our team and enhances our culture? Or are they going to be an anchor that, that we have to keep yanking along? And so it's not always about the number of stars they have. It's about do they fit what we're about. And so, you know, again, to go back to my very first statement, I'm generally not one to panic in recruiting, especially in the middle of, of, of June and July. Um, kind of let's, let's talk in December and see where, see where we land. Two more. Uh, Josh Newman from LoneStarLive.com. Steve, as the particulars um, of House versus NCAA continue towards being finalized or at least go before a judge, have you been given any indication of what a roster cap might look like? And short of that, do you have an opinion at this point? No, we really haven't. Um, you know, I think you know, there's the, the powers that be are, are working themselves through that. Um, and there's a lot of things on the table of what that's going to look like from roster cap to revenue sharing and, and how, the, how that's going to look. Um, in the end, I, I, we can look at that as a coach. I can look at that down the road. And you have to because there are some discussions on that. But more importantly for me is what are we doing this year, right? I just want to make sure I'm coaching next year <laughs> when, that, when that comes out. So you got to kind of focus on what, what are we doing this year and, and how are we maximizing the team that we have this year to put them in the best, best position to, to, to be successful and be the type of team that I think we can have. Coach Mike Roach from 24-7 Sports. Um, it feels like the recruiting calendar keeps moving earlier in the year. Uh, I know this year they introduced uh, contacting underclassmen in June now and pushing for summer signing day. There's been some talk about that. Just wanted to get your take on w what do you see as those scenarios? Are they an advantage? Are they, you know, what are the pros and cons and what are your personal thoughts on them? Yeah, I think the, um, I think the visits with the juniors um, – on campus that they're, that they're proposing now for January, as well as in spring recruiting, are a positive. Because so many kids now are taking official visits in the summer. And it's hard to identify a personality of a kid if you've never met mom and dad and had a real conversation and a real sit down and, and had some discussions with them. Um, because at the end of the day, these kids are committing very early, like we, t like we touched on. And how do you know? How do you know them? Because at the end of the day, we're held to the standard of how, who they are when we get them, right? And so if you, if you don't get to know the parents, um, because generally speaking, the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. And so you've got to get to know the parents. You've got to get to know the young men. You've got to be able to spend time. You've got to have those dialogues with them um, so that when you do get them on campus, hopefully they fit your culture and, and what you're about. I'm a little, um, quite frankly, um, hesitant on the summer signing period um, because I think you learn a lot about players in their senior year. Um, we continue to evaluate the tape into the senior season. Um, football, we're not – our sport development is so critical from ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, twelfth grade, and then when we get them, that development, right, for the NFL. And so, you know, we're – 
sometimes passing judgment on kids coming off of a junior year, and sometimes even in his junior year, maybe he was injured. And so how do you, how do you pull all that together? I think, I think there's an avenue that we can get done. I kind of like the calendar that we're having this year um, with that signing period in early December um, and then get into the portal because I still think we're protecting the high school player, which I think last year the high school player was not protected where the signing date was in the middle of December and the portal opened and some schools were dropping high school kids because they were taking the portal kid. I think now we're pr still protecting the high school kid in early December and then we can get ourselves into the portal. Um, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more hesitant maybe than others to, to have, a, have a signing date in, in summer when you're not even giving some kids a chance to play their senior year of, of, of high school football. All right, guys.